Hi everyone, welcome. Today we'll be going over the cell cycle. Before we begin, I want to make sure everyone has a solid understanding of what a chromosome and a chromatid are. Here we have a chromosome, and here we also have a chromosome. You see, chromosomes can come in different shapes, and commonly are seen like these two here. This circle in the center of the chromosome is called a centromere. This centromere determines how many chromosomes are present. One centromere equals one chromosome. This long shape here is called a chromatid. A chromatid is a piece of DNA, a DNA molecule. Technically, it's made of DNA and histone proteins. Here we have two chromatids. So on the left, we have one chromosome with one chromatid. And on the right, we also have one chromosome with two chromatids. Okay, so now that we can visualize the difference between a chromatid and a chromosome, let's move on to the cell cycle. The cell cycle is divided into two major phases, interphase and mitosis. Interphase is further divided into three phases. The first one is G1, or also called first gap. The second is S phase, also called synthesis. And the third phase is the G2 or second gap. Following interphase is mitosis. Mitosis is broken down into four phases. The first phase being the prophase, the second, the metaphase, the third is anaphase, and lastly, telophase. So let's go ahead and start off with G1 in the interphase. This is where all cells begin. So this is our cell, inside we have our nucleus, and inside the nucleus we have our chromatin. Remember, chromatin is a piece of DNA. At this point, this parent cell starts off with 23 chromatin from the mother and 23 chromatin from the father. The mother's genetic material is referred to as maternal and the father's genetic material is referred to as paternal. The first major thing that happens in G1 or GAP1 is the cell is performing its normal tasks. So it's basically just doing its normal job it's meant to do. The second thing is it begins to replicate organelles. It needs to replicate organelles and everything else within the cell because eventually this parent cell is going to split into two cells. These two cells are, by the way, called the daughter cells. And these daughter cells need to be identical to the parent cell. So every organelle within the cell must be du duplicated so both cells get equal amounts. One of the major organelles it duplicates is the centrosome. The centrosome has a huge role in DNA replication. It's going to assist moving the chromosomes in almost the entire process. Don't get centrosomes confused with centromere. Centromere, remember, is at the center of each chromosome, and the centrosome is referring to the structure outside of the nucleus that eventually creates microtubules that assist with moving the chromosomes. I normally don't like using tricks to memorize things, but in this case, I feel like these two words are super similar, so I like to think of the word centrosome like this. There is the word some in there. There is the word some in centrosome. So I think somewhere, somewhere out there. So where is the centrosome? Somewhere out there, okay? And of course, by default, centromere is referring to the center of the chromosome. Thirdly, the cell needs to synthesize or make RNA and enzymes that are needed for DNA replication because DNA replication is our next step. So G1 tends to be the longest phase, averaging about 6 to 12 hours. After G1, the cell now moves into the synthesis phase or S phase. Keep in mind, we are still in interphase. Your S phase lasts about 6 to 8 hours. The major thing that happens in synthesis phase is DNA replication. In other words, replication of each of the chromatin. So if we took a close up here and look at the chromatin activity during this phase, you would see every single chromatin duplicate itself. Remember that at the beginning of the S phase, your cell has 46 total chromatin, 23 maternal and 23 paternal. After DNA replication, which is the end of S phase, you have double the amount of chromatin. You now have 46 maternal and 46 paternal, with a grand total of 92 chromatin. 
it is really important for you to not only understand what's going on in each phase of the cell cycle, but also to keep track of the number of chromosomes and chromatin in each phase. Keeping track of this number, I think will help you understand the entire cycle better. So after replicating DNA, the cell enters G2 phase or GAP2. First, the cell continues to grow. Everything within the cell must grow in order to have sufficient amount for both daughter cells. Not just sufficient amount, but also it needs to have enough to give both daughter cells equal size and amount of everything. So for example, the cytoplasm, the mitochondria, the centrosomes, they are all going to continue to grow. Secondly, the centrosomes begin to mature and they make microtubules. Also, the centrioles begin to elongate. And by the way, the centrioles are referring to each of the long tubes that make up the centrosome. So essentially, a centrosome is made of centrioles. Next, the cell finally enters mitosis. The first stage of mitosis is prophase. In prophase, the chromatin condense and coil, and when they do this, they form the shape of an X. So if we again take a really close look at the activity within the nucleus, we'll see the chromatin that are exact copies of each other get nice and cozy together, and they eventually form a shape like this. One side of the X is one sister chromatid, and the other side of the X is the other sister chromatid. Remember, these two sisters are the exact copies of DNA. As a side note, remember, in interphase, you started off with 23 maternal chromatin and 23 paternal chromatin. During DNA replication, they all doubled. Chromatin went from a total of 46 to a total of 92. So this cell that entered mitosis entered with 92 chromatin. Also, there is a difference between chromatin and chromatid. Chromatin is referring to a DNA molecule when it is loose, messy, and the DNA itself is unrecognizable. Chromatid, however, is when this same DNA molecule is more structured. So chromatin makes up chromatids. Okay, so going back to the cell in the prophase, remember the 92 chromatids are now condensed and eventually will take the shape of an X. We still have 92 chromatids, however, they are paired up and now make up 46 paired chromosomes. Remember, we count the number of chromosomes by counting the number of centromeres. So here we have 46 centromeres, so we have 46 chromosomes. In prophase, the nuclear envelope also starts to dissolve. Losing the nucleus will eventually make it easier for the cell to split. Lastly, the centrosomes will begin to migrate to the opposite side of the cell. You can also call this the opposite sides of the poles. After prophase, the cell moves into metaphase. Here, the kinetochore form at the centromere. Kinetochores are a protein structure, and they are found on the centromere, but also on the microtubule spindle. Here's an illustration I found online that shows a bit how the kinetochore core works. It holds on to the microtubule and locks it in place. So next, the nuclear envelope in metaphase has completely dissolved and the centrosomes have now reached the opposite sides of the cell or pole. Lastly, and probably the most important, the chromosomes begin to line up at the metaphase plate. So all 46 chromosomes and 92 chromatids that make up those chromosomes will line up. This is the metaphase plate, by the way. And along with those chromosomes lining up, at the same time, the microtubule spindles will attach to the kinetochores on the centromere of every single chromosome. So basically, the centrosomes have these long arms called microtubules, and they will reach out and connect with each kinetochore at the centrosome of every single chromosome. Each chromosome should have a microtubule attached to it from each of the centrosomes. So basically, there's a microtubule attached to each of the sister chromatids. Once all chromosomes are attached to the microtubules, the cell enters anaphase. Here, the sister chromatids are pulled away from each other at both ends. So 46 chromatids are pulled to one side while 46 chromatids are pulled to the other side. And we are left with 46 chromosomes on both sides. 
Also, notice there is a mix of maternal and paternal chromatids on both sides of the cell. It's not just paternal on one side or maternal on the other. Secondly, the cell begins to elongate and accommodate both sets of chromosomes. The cell is now ready to enter telophase. First, a nuclear envelope is formed around both sets of chromosomes. The microtubules release the chromosomes and the organelles begin to move into their proper place. So for example, the centrosomes have no place in the nucleus, they shouldn't be there. So after releasing the chromosomes, it leaves out of the nucleus and goes somewhere out there. Secondly, and this step is really important, a cleavage furrow pinches the parent cell into two identical daughter cells. This process is called cytokinesis. Cleavage furrow and cytokinesis are both very necessary to learn, necessary to identify and understand both terms. So there's this little pinch here and little pinch there. These areas that are getting pinched are called the cleavage furrow. The cleavage furrow will increasingly pinch and sever the parent cells into two daughter cells. Each daughter cell will end up with 46 chromatids, which is equal to 46 chromosomes. Lastly, in telophase, the chromatids will uncoil and get messy again. In this stage, they are referred to as chromatin again. When telophase is absolutely complete, the cell is now able to make its way into the cell cycle again or leave and go into G0. So G0 is also known as the resting phase where the cells just chill out and do their normal jobs and really don't have to worry about replicating themselves. Okay, so we've gone over the entire cell cycle, but there are a few other important points you need to know about the cell division. One is understanding growth arrest and checkpoints. There are checkpoints within the cell cycle. There's one between G1 and S phase, one between G2 and mitosis or prophase, and one more between metaphase and anaphase. Cells must pass these checkpoints in order to move on to the next phase. Passing means they have this like check off list and the cells must have everything properly checked off. If it's unable to check off everything on the list, it will be arrested. So if at any point a cell does not pass the checkpoints, they go into growth arrest. Factors that stimulate growth arrest are crowding around the cell. So this is to prevent a tumor growing. If there is not enough space to grow, then the right thing for the checkpoint to do is say, hey, there is way too much growth around the area, so I really don't think you should be contributing to even more growth where we could become a tumor. So basically, it stops the cell from replicating itself. Other factors are oxidative stress on the cell. This includes cells that are just naturally aging and getting a bit too old to do their proper job. Infection, insufficient amount of growth factors or and or nutrients. Also damaged and incomplete DNA and cells that are not properly attached to their kinetochores. So all of these will alarm the enzymes around the checkpoints and stimulate them to cause an arrest on the cell. Other than the checkpoints and the growth arrest, there are three different types of states the cells can be in when not in the cell cycle itself. The first is quiescent state. These cells remain in dormant until stimulated. An example would be liver cells. They only divide if there is some kind of viral stress or toxic stress or trauma to the organ, like if someone gets stabbed in the liver, it has the opportunity to grow back because all of the cells are able to replicate themselves if stimulated. Next is the senescent state. These cells permanently do not enter the cell cycle. An example is a cell that has DNA that is too damaged for repair or naturally aged cells that we all get as we get older. These cells function begins to deteriorate and the cell eventually becomes slower. So we don't want those cells going through the stress of a cell cycle, nor do we want them to be replicated. Lastly, apoptosis. These cells are pre-programmed to die once they have completed their job. So for example, the cells that line your digestive tract are constantly dying. They die every two to three days after completing their work. Then new cells replace them instead of them regenerating. Lastly, there are three types of cells you should know. 
One is stable cells. These cells are not often in the cell cycle. They only go into the cell cycle if stimulated. They spend most of their time in G0, the resting phase. This includes hepatic cells or liver cells, epithelium of the kidney tubules, and lymphocytes. Label cells are cells that are constantly in the cell cycle and never go into the resting phase or G0, right? These cells proliferate often, meaning they reproduce rapidly. Example of these cells are skin cells, cells in the vaginal wall, and cells that are in the GI tract. Permanent cells go into the cell cycle once and that's it. They are birthed from the cell cycle and that's it. These are amitotic cells, a meaning without, so amitotic meaning they don't undergo mitosis. So we can relate some of these states like quiescent state, apoptosis, and senescent state with these types of cells, right? Stable cells are often in the quiescent state, labile cells undergo apoptosis, and permanent cells are often in the senescent state. Alrighty guys, that's it for now. Thank you so much for being here and sticking around this far. I hope you learned something new and until next time.